Hello, everyone. Thank you for coming to our talk. We're really amazed that so many have showed up here this late in the, in the day, and that's really nice. Um, we will promise you three things today, two, maybe three. Uh, first of all, we will give you a presentation without no YAML. I know that's almost not allowed here, but that's what we will do. Also, we will give you a demo, fingers crossed, uh, that's mostly visual. A little bit script, maybe, but mostly visual. Uh, so that should also be good here in, in the end of the day. And maybe we'll also show you a tool that will be useful for, for your needs. We'll see. So my name is Michael. I uh, come from Tutu Denmark. And I'm here with my colleague, Martin. And, and we will talk to you about how we have built a self-service platform, a self-service solution for our developers so that they can, can manage all their networking needs through a, this, this self-service uh, solution. So, Martin, what kind of company is, uh, is TV2 Denmark? Well, so TV2 Denmark is a uh, governmental-owned uh, commercial broadcasting station uh, that was founded in the late 80s. Uh, we're a public service provider, so we, we provide the Danes with news and entertainment. Um, for many years, our main products have been like a range of uh, linear broadcasting channels, uh, where the main channel was actually the most viewed linear channel in Denmark uh, last year. Um, but besides that, uh, we also have uh, some digital products. We have TV2DK, uh, the web page, uh, a website that, that mainly contains uh, news, um, along with some free mobile apps uh, for like, news, weather forecasting, uh, sports and TV program guide. Um, and then we have uh, our streaming service, uh, TV2 Play, which is a subscription-based streaming service. Um, and it's, it's one of Denmark's largest with uh, more than a million uh, subscribers. And the, actually for, for quite some years, we've had the streaming service doing both live TV uh, on-demand content. And uh, we also do some interesting things in terms of like uh, dynamic pop-up channels when there are big sp uh, sport events. We do some uh, linear ad replacement. So basically targeted ads on linear flow TV. Um, so, so we do some quite exciting things. Um, and, and throughout the years, our digital products have gained a lot more focus and, and popularity uh, due to the uh, decrease in, in uh, viewers on uh, linear TV. So TV2 as a company, uh, we are like around 1,500 employees in total. Uh, zooming in on the digital department, uh, we are a bit more than uh, 200 employees. Uh, in 20 different teams, uh, spread across uh, many different roles and responsibilities. Um, we have more than 10 products, uh, counting both uh, our public products, but also uh, internal products. So we do some internal tooling for, uh, for, for editors um, to uh, publish and prioritize content on uh, our uh, public products. So. <clears throat> Looking a bit on, on the cloud journey we've had so far, uh, so for the past four or five years or so, um, our development teams have been building their own cloud platforms. Uh, this means that today we have many similar platforms, but, but with some, uh, some difference in details. So, so we have many uh, different Snowflake, Snowflake platforms. Um, <coughs> we've basically been using uh, traditional ingress. Uh, um, most developers have been using traditional ingress to, to expose applications. Uh, some teams are using Istio for more advanced uh, networking. Um, and throughout the last couple of years, we've seen an increased need for, uh, for network features external to Kubernetes, uh, such as uh, web application firewalls, um, DDoS protection, uh, network filtering, and so on. Uh, so, last year we, uh, we established a platform team, um, tried to set out, build a, a common Kubernetes platform, a multi-tenant platform uh, that with time uh, will support uh, all of our developers. Um, the main focus is, like most other companies, to uh, reduce developer cognitive load, to, uh, to try to abstract away some of the infrastructure that most developers don't really care about, and, and provide a paved path for running applications in cloud. Um, one of the like, main principles uh, we are aiming towards is, is to try to use the Kubernetes API for everything. Um, and and uh, that, that's basically so, so whether we want to deploy an application or configure our network, uh, provision a database, we would use the Kubernetes API, but we would, of course, expose it with some kind of abstraction on top. Um, 
but we don't want to take away the freedom and autonomy that, that our developers have today. Uh, so we will use the GitOps uh, to enable self-service. Um, so <clears throat> one of the challenges we've seen uh, throughout the years uh, is, is basically flowing uh, things together from the Kubernetes world with uh, your cloud provider. Um, and, and we've been over a couple of different solutions to try to solve that. Um, basically, we, we provision infrastructure with Terraform like many others are doing. Uh, and then we've been using custom scripts and templates uh, to, uh, to basically configure our Kubernetes resources with the uh, right IDs and ARNs uh, from cloud resources. Um, then we did a bit of uh, experimentation with a tool called Cartographer, uh, which is basically a, a Kubernetes controller that you can use to build uh, templated supply chains. Um, it, it didn't quite fulfill the needs we had, so we set out to like, uh, build a custom controller using a framework called MetaController, uh, try to glue things together with that. Um, it's a, a simple fr a framework that, that makes it really simple to get started writing your own controllers. Um, but it, with the simplicity also came a bit some, some limitations that, again, didn't quite fulfill the needs we had. So in the end, we set out to build our own full-blown uh, Kubernetes controller from scratch using uh, KubeBuilder. And at the same time, uh, combined where, uh, where, we were, uh, building, where, where we were with building the platform, and uh, so on, we, we, we focused or uh, switched the focus a bit to, to network configuration, as that's a crucial part of the the common multi uh, the multi tenant platform we're building. Um, so, yeah, we we set out to build a Kubernetes controller implementing the gateway API, so we could use that for uh, configuring our network. So, how many here know gateway API? So. Approximately a third, I guess. How many here are using an implementation of Gateway API today? A handful, All right. So, <coughs> in, uh, <coughs> looking at uh, Ingress, it was uh, initially designed for, for simple, more simple traffic routing, uh, designed many years ago. Um, it is extensible, but it's only extensible via custom annotation, as it's a uh, network model that only consists of one uh, Kubernetes resource. Um, and because it only consists of one resource, it's, it's, uh, it also combines multiple uh, organizational roles and responsibilities into this one resource. Whereas Gateway API um, is a networking model that consists of uh, several Kubernetes resources, making, making it a bit more flexible. Um, <coughs> we already see uh, a lot of other CNCF tools um, that, that support Gateway API, uh, such as external DNS. Um, we expect a lot of other tools to support it in the future, so we also see it as a bit of like the new standard uh, and a more future-proof solution. <clears throat> On top of that, uh, given that, well, it consists of multiple resources, it's also role-oriented. So as you can see on the illustration here, I mean, you can have infrastructure providers specifying one part of the uh, conf uh, network configuration, can have cluster operators doing something else, and the application developers only uh, actually have to care about routing to the application. It's also quite expressive, so, so natively you have support for uh, uh, header-based routing, uh, traffic weighting, and so on. Um, and it's also an API that's, that's easily extensible uh, with your own custom resources. Um, <clears throat> so, uh, these models, uh, or well, the, the current implementations of, of these two models, uh, we, there's, there's not really that good support for, for network features uh, external to Kubernetes. Um, and that's something we tried to solve. Um, so, maybe Michael can tell you a bit more about how we utilize the Gateway API. Yes. <clears throat> so, so, what we did was that we used the Gateway API as the sole interface to our platform. When building a platform, the API choice is really, really essential because that will be, I mean, what you present to all your users. And we use the Gateway API for all roles in our platform. So not only infrastructure providers, but also tooling. So the Gateway API becomes the main integration point for all tooling, tooling that we're using now, and tooling that we will use in, in the future. So that's one of the powers of a common API. 
And of course, most importantly, it also becomes an API that we present to our developers. And with all the configuration now in, uh, defined through the Gateway API, all we need for our platform is just somehow a mechanism to provision uh, an end-to-end uh, an -end data path. Um, and this is what a gateway controller does. That is simply provisioning this, this data path. Now here we are, we are stressing that it's an end-to-end -end path. And why do we do that? That is because uh, we really want this data path to be, be from customer all the way to business logic. Because if it isn't end-to-end, -end, then it's really not a self-service solution. If someone else needs to go in and here and define and part of the data path, it's not really a self-service solution, we think. So that's why we stress that it's an end-to-end -end path. Now, in our case, because we have so many products and teams that have different needs, are evolving at different speeds and, and so on, we want to be in more control of the, this actual data path. We want to introduce features and, and, and things as we go along that, that suit the needs of our, of our individual teams. And this is where we, we didn't find a solution that, that fitted our needs. Um, so that's why we decided that we would build our own controller that would, would, I mean, kind of scratch our itch and do what we want to do so that we can fulfill the needs of our, uh, our product teams. Um, when we did this, made this choice that we would develop our own controller, we also made the choice that, hey, we do not want to do all the heavy lifting ourselves. There's actually already other controllers that can do a lot of the heavy lifting. So we decided that this controller should should, uh, I mean, it should respond to gateway API definitions. That should be kind of the things that drive what it does. And this controller should then generate other Kubernetes resources. So for example, we could use Crossplane to talk to the, the, the cloud API that we want, where we want to provision our resources. So then, this means that our controller just needs to, to create, for example, Crossplane resources, and then the Crossplane controller for, for example, an AWS cloud will pick up those resources and implement whatever our controller has generated. Likewise, we also need a data path inside Kubernetes. We need something there, or we may need something there. In the same way, we could let our controller create, let's say, deployments. We could also let our controller create, through the Gateway API, a data path that can be implemented by another controller. For example, we could use Istio, which is also an API Gateway implementing controller, which implement a data path already. So in, we could also create a data path in this way. This is just an example using Crossplane uh, and using Istio. Uh, our controller is not, I mean, this is not hard-coded in the controller that we're using Crossplane and Istio, because in fact, we also wanted to make this data pass definition generic and re reusable. Ideally, we want to be able to share these blueprints with you so that we can have a controller that, that implements the gateway API, and then through some shareable generic blueprints, uh, pluggable blueprints, I think we can share uh, be able to implement a data path that has a specific characteristics, a specific design. Uh, so that's an important thing of, of our design, that is we, we separate the controller from the actual data path implementation. So now we're talking about these data paths. So what kind of features are we talking about and why is it so important that we have control of this? Our teams have re different uh, requirements and needs. So, and some teams might just be, be happy with a simple data path as, as shown here a cloud load balancer, and then forwarding that to a Kubernetes resource a service, and then they are, they are quite happy. We have other teams that use Istio uh, or a service mesh. So in their case, they would need an ingress gateway as, as part of the data path. So in that case, we need to implement that uh, for, for, for them. Other teams might have even more needs. I mean, some may have an opinion on what traffic should be locked, how should it be locked, where should it be locked to. Uh, it could also be that they have an opinion on what should be the network attachment should, of, of this load balancer. I mean, should it be exposed on the internet? Should it be only on the internal, net, uh, internal network, for example? It could, could also be that they have an opinion on who should have access to this load balancer. It could be that they want to, to limit access through an IP side range or maybe, maybe through ID, uh, OpenID Connect, for example. Such things we also need to, to, to cater for. It could also be that they want to do more advanced processing of, of, uh, of the network traffic. Some of the features we typically associate with API gateways, not to be confused with gateway API. So this is a mechanism that can, that can process data in, in, in many different ways, which cloud, cloud providers also support. It could also be that they want to use a serverless uh, version of, of load balancing, because that has a different, load, uh, different cost profile. And so on, there's actually quite many features that are 
teams or products are actually using now, and there are features here that, that we want to add in the future as a part of the platform team, and which we might want to introduce without the developers having to know. We would like them to use this golden path, and then we will be able to control what are the, the features, for example, fe security features, that we add to this, to this golden path. When we set out to design this controller, we made one key design principle, which is, I mean, the overarching design principle for, for the controller. And that is that the, the data paths or the blueprints for the data paths, they should be based on templating, not code. That was really an essential thing for us to do. Because this is what allows us to evolve these data paths without having to, having to change the controller. Imagine that we want to change the, the Kubernetes resources that goes into a data path, and we needed to recompile our controller, build a new container image, and do a new release, and, and all that, just to do a tweak on, on the Kubernetes resources that, that, uh, that the data path is, is built out of. That's really not ideal. And, and separating the, the, the blueprints from the controller is also a foundation for making the blueprints shareable and generic. And, and finally, because these blueprints just contains templates for Kubernetes resources, which could be cross-plane or Istio or anything else. Uh, it also makes the gateway, gateway controller that we are presenting here cloud agnostic, because you could just because I mean, we're just using uh, we, we're building data paths for, for AWS. But if you have a need for building data paths for Azure or, or, or Google, uh, then you could definitely do that. I should also say, um, if you look at, uh, at this picture here. This is really the mental model of, of our controller. Think of it as a generic controller responding to gateway API definitions and creating Kubernetes resources on, uh, when it implements the data path. So if you're thinking, does this work for me in my scenario, then the, the, question would, the answer would be, if you're thinking of data paths that can be implemented with Kubernetes resources, uh, then most likely it will fit. I mean, you could be on Cilium, you could be on Asia, or you could, I mean, whatever platform that you have underneath, if you can present, represent your data path through Kubernetes resources, then most likely this controller will, will suit your needs. Okay. Having decided on templating, we acknowledge that templating, there's only so many things you can do with templating. I mean, it's not an ideal expressive language. It's not as expressive as code, or at least it's, it's difficult to express the same things with templating. So we acknowledge that having decided on templating, while it's a great benefit of this controller, it's most likely also its greatest liability. So this triangle here is supposed to illustrate that this controller operates within three main constraints, and one of them being, being templating. The two others are the inputs and the outputs. We are responding to gateway API resources. They are already a settled design, or mostly a settled design. We have to abide by that standard, and we cannot uh, deviate from that, because then we wouldn't be an API gateway compliant controller. So we need to abide by that. Similarly, the API or the, the gateway, sorry, the Kubernetes resources we create as on, on the output side, they are also, I mean, they could be cross-plane resources or other gateway API resources. There's also a fixed schema for that. So in the same way, we cannot deviate from that. So we also need to create schema compliant resources there. So these are the three main constraints that our operator work within. And it's actually major constraints because going, for example, from the Gateway API to the appropriate cloud uh, definition of the cloud resources that we, you want to create, that is not a one-to uh, conversion. I mean, you can't go from, say, a Gateway API gateway definition and say, hey, I'll just convert this through a template into a load balancer resource. That's not how it works. Typically, it will take five, ten different cloud resources to implement a gateway. So it's a one-to-many here. It's the same going the other way. Uh, setting the proper status statuses and condition on gateway uh, API resources, that's not just a question about copying a single field from some resource. That's typically also something that is, is yeah, a little bit more complicated than, than that. So these are main constraints. We want to highlight them here. Uh, we think it's also part of the strengths using templates, but it also means there are yeah, things that can be difficult. So to help with this, we introduced, oh yeah, I have an example here that also shows where templating is, is difficult. Um, imagine you have a gateway, a gateway definition that says, hey, I will allow route uh, attachments from, from any namespace that has uh, the label foo bar. And we, then we also have three namespaces that each define an HTTP route and say, I want to uh, connect or associate myself with uh, this, uh, this gateway. Now, the two first namespaces has the required label, while the third does not. 
So in this case, it's quite obvious that when we implement this, we should ignore the third route. If we imagine that the data path here also contains uh, templates for creating a certificate, for example, then the question arises, what host name should be in those certificates? Again, the obvious answer is the host name from the two first ACP routes and the third host name should be, should be ignored. I mean, this is easy for us, but expressing this with, templ with templating is a bit difficult. So to, to make this more easy, to make this actually workable in the controller, we introduce something that we call normalization. And, and what that is, is that the controller will react to gateway API definitions. It will then encode with whatever we can do in code. It will process those gateway API resources and do the hard things in code. Create something we call a normalized model, a model that contains pre-computed data, you can say, that's easier for templating to, to take and express in, in the actual data path. Now, this normalization here will then implement, for example, the filtering that we saw on, that would be necessary in the example that we saw on the, the previous slide. Another thing we did that was that because we want these data path blueprints to be generic, uh, this means that they cannot contain any contextual configuration because then they wouldn't be generic if we didn't do that. Uh, so what we did here is that we used uh, this Gateway API Enhancement Proposal 713, which is about how you attach uh, additional configuration to the, to the uh, standard, standardized uh, Gateway API resources. So this means that we can attach additional things, additional policies, or actually any configuration to these Gateway API resources. So in the example that we have here, we have a, a developer that has uh, express that they want to have a gateway created. And we also have an infra infrastructure provider that has created a gateway class. And a gateway class is kind of a, a named gateway implementation. Uh, together with that, the infrastructure provider has also uh, uh, configured that gateway class to use a specific gateway class blueprint. And the blue box here, the gateway class blueprint, that's a CRD that we have created as part of this controller. It's not part of the gateway API. The green boxes are standardized uh, gateway API resources but the blue box is our generic blueprint that expresses or defines how is the architecture of this given, given, given data path. And this is where the templates are contained. Again, these are without contextual configuration, so it's not implementable what we have here. It's only the, the architecture, you can say, the blueprint that's in this, in this uh, blue CRD here. And what we're missing to make this implementable is that we miss, yeah, and these are the generic. So, so what we're missing to make this implementable is this contextual configuration. So for example, we have some environment specific configuration that is needed. It could be VPC or subnet ideas. That is information that we need to be able to implement the blueprint that says something about uh, the load balancer, for example. Additionally, since this is a plat for a platform, uh, the, the infrastructure provider might, may add, might also have some contextual configuration that's needed uh, for, for the application developer here, which we call a tenant. So this could, for example, be tagging rules. It could be that the, the infrastructure provider says, whenever this tenant creates a load balancer, I want it to be tagged in a specific way so, so that I can, for example, do cost attribution. And finally, the application developer might also have some contextual configuration that might, they want to attach. So it could be, for example, the logging configuration, it could be the open ID configuration, which would have access to the load balancer and, and so on. So there are these three categories of contextual configuration that we want to associate with these resources here. And to do that, we created two more CRDs. We created something we call a gateway class config. It's a CRD that contains the contextual configuration that is needed, for example, the VPC and subnet IDs. And then we use this GEP713 mechanism to attach that CRD to the gateway class. So we're basically saying whenever you want to implement a data path from this, uh, from this gateway class and the associated blueprint, then this is the environment-specific context con uh, configuration that you should also need in, in this. And the same way with the tenant-specific configuration here. Now we're not associating it with the gateway class, but we're associating it with the namespace of the tenant. So this becomes the, the default of that uh, when we create resources or gateways for, for that tenant. Again, this is owned by the infrastructure provider. The tenant cannot change this. It's the infrastructure provider that associated with the, the tenant's gateway or uh, namespace when they create the namespace. And finally, we have this gateway config CRD, which is a, a CRD that the application developers or the tenants can create with, a, with a whatever contact configuration that they have, they, that they want to associate uh, with the gateway. So now, this is the logical view of how we have 
designed and configured our, our data path. Remember this picture, because this, while this is the abstract view, this is what we will be showing in the demo with actual, uh, actual gateway resources, actual gateway classes, actual blueprints, and, and the gateway class config resources, and, and so on. So Martin, would you describe the, the demo use case we will present? Yeah, sure. So we are describing this uh, foo example use case uh, that's also uh, mentioned in the uh, Gateway API documentation. So imagine we have a uh, like infrastructure team or SRE team uh, that defines a gateway, uh, specifying the configuration uh, for the gateway using this host name. Um, <clears throat> then we have uh, one development team, uh, the uh, foo site team, uh, who deploys their full site service and, and speci basically uh, specifies an HTTP route, specifying the routing to that application, utilizing the gateway. Another team, the full store team, would then uh, have two uh, different versions of their full store service, uh, and they specify uh, routing to, uh, to that service using the same uh, gateway, with 90% uh, going to version 1 and 10% going to version 2. So. We'll try to demo this, uh, and hopefully that works. Um, Mike will just set it up. Uh, in, we, uh, we tried to visualize this uh, using a small tool we made um, that uh, visualizes uh, uh, gateway API resources. So we start with an empty cluster, um, where we only have Istio uh, and Crossplane uh, installed. Uh, so uh, what you see here is we, we only have a gateway class, uh, an Istio gateway class deployed to the cluster. So we as a platform team now apply um, a blueprint, blueprint and two uh, gateway classes uh, defining an internal and public uh, data path. And as you see here, we have the uh, three different resources. The uh, gateway class blueprint uh, uses AWS, Crossplane, and Istio to specify the data path. Um, this is... Um, this is just a template, so now we apply the configs uh, to set the environment specific, specific values. So the internal gateway class we have uh, specified to use the private subnets and uh, using public subnets for the uh, public gateway class, as well as uh, different tagging. Uh, <clears throat> then we uh, set up uh, a, um, another gateway class config uh, for a tenant um, namespace, and as you can see here, it. it it's not really attached anywhere because, well, there's no gateway API resources in that namespace. So, so if we uh, have a, uh, a SRE DevOps uh, persona specifying a gateway and applying that to the, that namespace, we see that it will use the gateway class config that we just applied to the namespace. Uh, next up, we will uh, whitelist our local CIDR, uh, so specify an ACL, so allowing us to, uh, to, to basically um, reach the uh, services that will use this gateway. As, as we can see here, there's a gateway config attached to that gateway that uh, whitelists our own uh, IP address. Now the developers can actually deploy their services uh, along with HTTP routes, specifying the routing to, uh, to the application, applications using the gateway that uh, we applied. And, and as you can see, uh, I hope it's not too small, uh, um, the uh, full site service and the two different versions of the two full store services applied. Um, we have uh, the HTTP routes and everything is connected. The controller is not running yet. We're deploying that now, uh, meaning that uh, this is just set up. When the controller is deployed, it will pick, pick up the resources and it will actually uh, create the Kubernetes resources that are defined uh, in the blueprint uh, with the uh, uh, combination of the different configs uh, so configure with, with the values that's specified in, in the different configs. And shortly we should, should see uh, some, some more resources being provisioned, uh, hopefully. Um, and uh, creating all the different resources uh, takes a while. Um, so we may not uh, have time to, to show you that there's actually we're able to curl the services, but uh, if there's time, we'll, we'll show you that. Um, the, the, it's, it's basically the load balance that takes approximately three minutes to provision. As you can see here, uh, we now have an Istio child gateway provisioned uh, that utilizing the Istio gateway class. We also have some child HTTP route resources. Um, so <clears throat> the gateway controller uh, uh, yeah, uh, handled all the different resources that we applied. 
So, as you can see here, um, the different resources, uh, yeah, so the bottom resource here is the load balancer and it's in falls. Uh, it's not ready yet because it's, it's being provisioned. So while we wait for that, we will just uh, go back to the presentation and move on to some of the learnings we've had. Um, so, yeah, basically Gateway API is not really a trivial API to implement. Um, turns out that, I mean, that there's a lot of code to be done. Uh, approximately two-thirds of the code base is, is implementing the Gateway API. Um, and the, uh, the last third is, is templating, which uh, still seems like a good choice. Um, it, it's, it's really a balance, uh, but, but it, it seems like a good choice for us. Um, and uh, yeah, uh, we also had a couple of other um, learnings. Uh, at, and one of the, those I would highlight is that, well, the normalization process is also like, it, it can easily become a garbage can. Um, because if you have a use case that doesn't fit into the templating, then you would just fix it with code. And yeah, so, so the code base could uh, easily uh, evolve and end up being a garbage can. Um, I don't know, should we, do you think it's still ready? Is it's it not ready. No, not ready yet, All right. So basically, that's it. Um, the project is open source. Uh, there's a QR code for it. It's called Bifrost Gateway Controller, and it's present in the T2-OSS uh, GitHub repository. Uh, this is our first open source project. It's also our first KubeCon talk. Uh, we're really excited to be here. So uh, feedback and contributions are more than welcome. It could be fun to like, see some other blueprints uh, with other use cases, uh, other cloud providers, and so on. So yeah, reach out. And uh, yeah, you want yeah. To? Just one thing, uh, maybe uh, jumping in for a question. Uh, I, 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 would, I would expect that a obvious question would be, how does this blueprint look like? What is? And we decided not to show any YAML. That's why we haven't shown it to you. But you can think of it as, I mean, it's Go templating. So if you can think of, or you can think of it as a mix between a Helm template and a cross-plane composition. So it's really about Go templating, but where you where you can reference between resources because uh, a, a data pass, you cannot instantiate a data pass like it was a Helm chart because sometimes you need to create a resource and wait for some of the status fields to be updated and then you can pass on some of those status fields into the next resource. That's why we, we, we also have some of the cross pane composition patching mechanism, if you know that, in, into, this, uh, into this design. Okay, are there any questions? There are mics at, at the end, if there's uh, any questions. Thank you. Seems to be no questions. Yeah, that's a question. Great. It, it, so, um, with Gate, Gateway API not being released yet, how how are you guys gonna do? You put this in production, or how do you feel comfortable evolving this project when the core component isn't released yet? I think we have a lot of confidence in the Gateway API not really changing in the era that we have used here. And if it changes, I mean, we are moving fast and breaking things. That's no problem. I also think we heard in, uh, in this uh, KubeCon here that it's a plan to move uh, Gateway API to a GA uh, this year. So, I mean, we're not really worried about that. And, I mean, and also, um, we're not using it in production yet. Uh, we, we plan to, to use it in production by the end of the year, uh, depending on how things go. Yeah. And it is ready now, I think. Yeah. So, those of you who didn't leave yet, uh, should be able to see that we can actually curl uh, the two services. Yeah.